888-971-SAGE. 888-971-7243. Larry Elder, ReliefFactor.com studio. So much to get to between now and the close of the program. My goodness. Protesters invading wealthy suburbs in New York. In St. Louis. Beverly Hills. Spray painting, shouting slogans. Red paint thrown at George Washington in New York. Chicago, 63 shot this past weekend, 16 fatally. Chicago driveway, drive-by killed a 20-month-year-old child. 20-month-old child. What was it, uh, a three-year-old and a three-year-old in Chicago and in Baltimore two weekends ago? Activists are demanding that the John Wayne Airport out here in Orange County, California be renamed because of statements John Wayne made in a Playboy interview back in 1971 and some other things he said that therefore makes him a bigot. I was just thinking about other people that have made inappropriate statements. Did you know that Harry Truman, the beloved Harry Truman, once referred to Jews as the K-word? In New York as K-Town, except he didn't say K. Shall we erase everything from him? John F. Kennedy. There's a book called The Dark Side of Camelot, written by Seymour Hersh, who was a reporter with the New York Times, so therefore it must be credible. He referred to African countries as boogie republics and threatened to send a diplomat to one of the boogie republics who had crossed him in some sort of way. That's not the same as S-hole countries, but that's pretty close, isn't it? Stay woke! John F. Kennedy also cruelly treated Sammy Davis Jr., who campaigned for him in 1960. Sammy Davis Jr. supported JFK, campaigned very heavily in black areas. The idea was that the entertainer would somehow get black people to vote for JFK. And he was engaged, Sammy Davis Jr., to a white actress. I think she was European. Swedish, I think. I'm sure someone will correct me. He postponed his wedding so that it would not adversely impact the election prospects of John F. Kennedy. Let's remember, this is before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There was a big divide in the South about which way the South was going to go. In fact, that's why JFK was in Dallas to mend a fence between warring Democratic factions over the issue of integration. He didn't want to lose them. He didn't want to lose Texas for re-election. That's why he was down there, down there for fence mending. In any case, Sammy Davis Jr. postponed his wedding because he knew that the publicity or felt the publicity would adversely affect JFK since he was a JFK supporter, so he postponed the wedding. Got married after JFK got elected. And then got disinvited to perform at the inaugural. I don't mean not invited. He was uninvited. He had been invited, and after he got married to this white actress, JFK rescinded the invitation to perform at the inaugural. Is this thing on? Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy is the one who authorized wiretaps on Martin Luther King. Yep, J. Edgar Hoover requested them, but without the approval of the AG, MLK could not and would not have been wiretapped. Is this thing on? You really want to play this game? Find something somebody said and nullify everything they've ever done because of that? Because we're looking at the world through the prisms of our 
much more enlightened, much more sensitive point of view. Is that fair? All the things that are going on right now in the world, dealing with this coronavirus, dealing with the reaction to the coronavirus and so many bankruptcies, so many businesses gone forever, so many suicides projected, depression, spousal abuse, drug abuse, alcoholism as a result of our response to this pandemic. And again, I remind you in 1968, there was a pandemic known as the Hong Kong flu. If you adjust for population, 150,000 Americans died. There's still 25,000 more than have died so far because of this coronavirus pandemic. And I'm not saying it's not going to exceed that. I'm just telling you, in 1968, more people died from the Hong Kong flu adjusted for population than have died so far from the coronavirus pandemic, and I do not remember it. And I was 16. And I'm somebody who pays attention to the world, pays attention to the news, always have. Not saying people weren't talking about it, I just don't remember it being top of news. The organizer of Woodstock, which took place in 1969, was asked about it, and he said, When the festival took place, nobody was wearing masks. Nobody was talking about social distancing. Nobody was talking about staying at home, avoiding non-essential travel. He said it had two two peaks and we missed it. We were kind kind of in the middle. But it was not like he was unaware of it. The point is the economies did not shut down. States did not shut down their economies. Now, ultimately, there was a vaccine for that, but by then, the crisis pretty much had passed. And right now, cases are spiked up, spiking up in several states. Deaths are still down, but deaths are always a leading, uh, uh, lagging indicator. So we'll see. But either way, what most people have done, most people have decided, is that we have to coexist until there is more effective treatment until there's a vaccine. And the vaccine, we're told, could be anywhere from three months to six months to nine months to a year from now. They're already beginning tests in several countries. And remember, the whole point was to ensure that our healthcare system would not be overtaxed. And that's why we had the stay-at-home orders. That's why we were doing all these things. Not because we thought it was going to conquer the virus. But we wanted to make sure that there was not going to be a rush on ICUs, a rush on ventilators. Something that appears to have been avoided. But then the goalpost was shifted. In my my opinion, it was shifted because of the guy who's in the White House. It'd be wonderful to have two identical worlds. In one case, President Obama is in charge. And the exact same thing happens. Same epidemic, same thing. Same advice given, same... A sloppiness at the, at the CDC, same uh, inconsistent advice given by the leading expert like Dr. Fauci, same lies uh, told to the World Health, Health Organization by China, same lies that were parroted by the World, World Health Organization, all that. Interesting to see how the media would be, would be responding. Because after a while, the American people said, look, I, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to have to coexist. We, we now know who the high-risk people are. They're older people. We know we need to really concentrate on older people and assisted living nursing homes, people with com- comorbidities, people who live in high-dense areas. Now we've got some idea of this. And then people go back to work and the cases spike up. Do you think the media would be going nuts like this if Obama were in office? Or would they say, well, the spikes are going up because people are going back to work and we anticipate it more testing, and therefore there'd be more, uh, more cases. You think they'd maybe have some perspective? I think so. Deaths are down nine, 70%, you know. Again, lagging indicator. They may go up, but they're down substantially, even as cases are up. I'm Larry Elder.
This is Lon He Chen of the Hoover Institution for townhall.com. Public health officials across America have spent the last several months warning about the dangers of the coronavirus and the need for us to stay at home, halt economic activity, and avoid social interactions with our friends and neighbors. We are now reopening our economy in many parts of the country, but these same public health officials have compromised their own credibility as we do so. On the one hand, they've urged caution and a slow return to work, school, and faith gatherings. They've criticized those who oppose the stay-at-home orders. But at the same time, these officials have been broadly supportive of the large protests on America's streets in the last few weeks. Public health officials should be helping us understand the comparative risks of activities, not endorsing the causes they like while prohibiting the ones they don't. Their hypocrisy is costly indeed. They have impacted our ability to address future health crises. I'm Lan He Chen. ADF, fighting for those whose liberties are being violated. If you could do one thing that changed you forever, would you? How about something extraordinary? A bucket list item packing years of memories into 10 exciting days. Chart a new path by joining Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Set a clear new vision for yourself this year and join me on the Stand with Israel tour this December 2nd to 11th. Along with special guest Mike Lindell. God freed me from these and other addictions and started me on a path to a restored heart. Praise Jesus. Discover over 40 iconic sites as you encounter the life-changing impact of a journey to the Holy Land. Surrounded by like-minded travelers, picture yourself stepping foot in key locations right out of history. Much more than a vacation, this journey guides you through one of the most politically and spiritually significant places in the world. Explore Jerusalem, Galilee, the Dead Sea region, and so much more. Along the way, Dr. Sebastian Gorka will broadcast live and on-site as you watch and participate. Reserve your spot today for this incredible journey. Call today to join Dr. Sebastian Gorka on this life-enriching Israel tour, December 2nd to 11th, 2020. Call 855-565-5519 or book online at StandWithIsraelTour.com. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. Bubba gets um, Don Lemon and defends himself. He doesn't say, isn't this wonderful? See, if a, a decent man, and I don't know him from Adam, but I can only say a decent man would have said, I am so relieved. If I found uh, something anti-Semitic in my workplace, do you know how relieved I would be to to learn it was not, in fact, anti-Semitic at all? That I had misapprehended what it was? Why isn't he relieved for himself, for NASCAR, and for the country? Tell me why. Why does this not indict his character? I, I, I would almost pay for somebody who wants to defend his decency to call in now. 1-8-Prager-776. 877-243-7776. Leftism makes you a worse human being. Black, white, biracial, L, G, B, T, Q, Cisgender, non-gender, transgender, Jew, Christian, atheist, secularist, Mormon, Buddhist, get it? Whatever you are, leftism makes you work. Yes. So uh, the way that this Black Lives Matter can end is all Black Lives Matter, not an issue. The Jews went through the Holocaust, and they don't burn down the Holocaust. They keep it there. They remember never again. So black men and women, proud, successful, shoulders back, never again. Nobody wants to hold someone back. They are, they're loved. They're treated with respect. Everybody has respect until you open your mouth. So black lives matter, beautiful. Put your shoulders back. Act part of the community. 
love the white guy, love the black guy, love the yellow guy, love them all until they do something to you directly. That's how this all can end. So we all treat each other right, and you all have A's until you open your mouth, and then you're on your own, and you suffer the consequences. Not a color thing. It's an intellectual thing of how smart you are when you say something. Larry, thanks so much. I'm going to go see your movie. Hey, Larry, this is Elsa from Rancho Cucamonga. I just wanted to let the people know out there, especially the Democratic voters, that, hey, does Black Lives Matter? They're going to destroy your life. They're going to destroy your liberty and your right to be free here in the United States. If they were on TV last night and they heard about the uh, leader of the Black Lives Matter that's supposedly getting threats, he already threatened the U.S. by saying on national TV that if they don't get what they want, they'll destroy the establishment. Is that what they want? I hope to God they don't. Triple eight nine seven one S A G E triple eight nine seven one seven two four three. Larry Elder, ReliefFactor dot com studio. Now you've helped build my pillow into the fantastic company it is today, and Mike Lindell, the president and CEO, wants to give back. He's making face masks as a country is continuing to deal with this coronavirus and is giving them free to hospitals all around the country. He's also offering you a great discount on all MyPillow products. Just go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio listener specials, and check out some amazing offers. Buy one, get one free. Supima MyPillows, Giza Dream Sheets, MyPillow Towels, Roll and Go Anywhere Pillows, Duvet Covers, Giza Pillowcases, Bolster Pillows, Neck Pillows. Plus, if you buy Mike Lindell's book, What Are the Odds? From Crack Addict to CEO, you're going to get free shipping and a $25 gift card. MyPillow.com, promo code Larry, or call 800-890-1843, and be sure and use promo code Larry. That's 800-890-1843, and be sure and use promo code Larry. Next hour, we're going to be talking with Professor Lee Ohanian from UCLA, one of our favorite guests. He's an economist. I'm concerned about the $3 trillion to the national debt that the federal government has added with all of these so-called stimulus packages. We shut down the government prevent people from working, and then we print money to give to the people who we stopped from not working because we stopped them from not working. And this is not supposed to have any kind of adverse consequence, inflation. This so-called uh, quantitative easing and printing of money was done during the Obama years. And the inflation that I thought was going to happen and that many people expect it to happen, never happened. Or did it? Or are they under-counting inflation, giving you the impression that prices are not growing as fast as they are, in fact, growing? So I'm going to talk to Leo Hanian about all of this next hour. $3 trillion in new debt. People keep saying, well, the budget was balanced during the Bill Clinton years, but debt grew. You can balance the budget simply by making sure that your receipts and expenditures match. You can still increase your expenditures, though, and you can increase your receipts by just jacking up taxes. You haven't done anything, but you've balanced the budget. Now, there was a tweet that the president retweeted. And it's an exchange between some seniors in something called the Villages in Florida. They were on a golf court, golf cart, and people start yelling at them. This is about two weeks ago. This is at a Central Florida retirement area called the Villages. And there's a procession, a procession of golf carts. And it passes protesters holding signs. And one guy's holding a sign that says, Make America Sane Again. One sign holder asks one, ask of one of the guys driving the cart, where's, where's your white robe? Now, at first, this driver, he had a cart that said, Trump 2020 and America first on it, which is, which is what prompted the where's your right robe thing. And so he first flashed thumbs up sign. And then he chants white power twice and pumps his fist in the air. 
And the protester goes, there you go, white power, you hear that? So, here's what happened. Where's your white voice? Wait a minute. That says he said, "Where's your white hood?" Didn't he? He didn't say robe. He said hood. Where's your white hood? No. Where's your white hood? That's what he's saying. Where's your white hood? Yeah, this is the guy that had the guy driving by in a cart with Trump 2020 on the cart and America First, and the sign holder yells at him and says, "Where's your white hood?" That's what he said. Where's your white Okay, so that goes on for another minute and a half, and Trump sends it. Trump retweets it. And the white power part is what the media jumped on, and of course, Trump quickly deleted it. And the White House claimed he didn't hear the white power part. Oh, oh, listen to your president if you want nasty language, you idiot. Officer, get back in your car, you said to me. Get back in your car. You got a woman. One of the women holding the sign that says Trump bigot and racist, and she was shouting, F Trump, F Trump. Later on, she yells a few more expletives, but all anybody cares about is the, the white guy that yelled white power, and he did it just to tick him off, because at first he had a thumbs up, and he just wanted to say something to make him go nuts, and it, and it worked. Guys retired, gone to Florida, probably used to live in Chicago. Who knows what he used to do for a living, minding his own business, just wants to golf. All of a sudden, he's serenaded because he's got a Trump thing on his thing. And he wears your white hood. So he says, all right, white power. Oh, there it is. There it is. I told you. He's a bigot. Remember what Chris Matthews said about this? Mainly it's for white people because white people won't vote for a guy, most of them, if they think they're racist. So can you knock off the dog whistle thing? Hey, Donald Trump was sending another dog whistle to his people. Here, Chris Matthews, a Trump hater, is admitting white people won't vote for somebody if they think he's a racist. So knock it off. Really? Black Lives Matter has issued its demands. 63 people shot in Chicago, 16 fatally. I'm Larry Elder. America, we have a country to save. And now, here's Larry Elder. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. This is the uh, the governor of uh, of New York, who has had this uh, weird segment apparently regularly. I haven't seen one second of it. I couldn't bear to watch Andrew Cuomo and Chris Cuomo swapping stories about who Mom loves best. It is one of the grossest examples of journalistic um, nonsense. Oh, you're so great. Oh, no, you're so great. Here's the CNN primetime host interviewing the governor of New York, the brothers, and it's like two frat boys comparing notes on Friday night in the frat house uh, playing some beer pong. It's it's unreal that that, that CNN would, uh, and, and oh, it's, it's such a, t- it's just gross. But here's, here's Cuomo last night on CNN with a message to the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis. I say to them all, look at the numbers. You played politics with this virus and you lost. You told the people of your state and you told the people of this country, White House, uh, don't worry about it. Just open up, go about your business. This is all uh, democratic uh, uh, hyperbole. Oh, really? Turn it off. Uh, Stop now it. you see 27 Play states with the numbers going. with this virus and you lost. Oh, really? What was the race that Florida lost compared to New York? Let me remind this arrogant, smug, sanctimonious jerk of a governor that it was his mandate that nursing homes in New York have to accept COVID-19 sick patients. 
that led to the deaths of thousands of seniors in New York's nursing homes. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Now, there is a story this morning that one of the best guys in the Senate on the other side, Chris Coons, is talking about doing away with the legislative filibuster. I personally do not believe that they will mo- they will hesitate for a minute if they win the Senate, which is why we've got to reelect Cory Gardner and Tom Tillis and Martha McSally and David Perdue and Joni Ernst, and there are a couple others who they're targeting. But do you think they will do away with the legislative filibuster, Senator well, Scott, and what do you, you think will be the consequences of that? Chris, Chris Coons led the effort to keep it when Trump got elected, right? And now he's leading the effort to get rid of it if Biden gets elected. I mean, how disingenuous that somebody would do that. Take this position if this person's the president, this position this person's president. However, I've been there 18 months. It's really consistent. The Democrats do it every day. So, yeah, do I believe they'll get rid of it? Yeah, they'll, they'll do that. They'll try to stack the Supreme Court. You know, they'll, they'll do everything they can to make sure they have power forever. That's all they care. They don't care about you. They don't care about making your life better. They, they care about their power. That's what they care about every day. The Democrats, all they care about is power. Senator, you just said they'll stack the Supreme Court. You don't really believe, do you, that they will move to expand the number of seats on the Supreme Court? You, they will do everything that they think they can get away with. If you think about this, think about what you just said about Chris Coon, a guy that led the effort to make sure we didn't get rid of the filibuster when Trump got elected, but is now going to lead the effort to get rid of the filibuster if Biden gets elected. So what else will they do? Senator Rick Scott, uh, that'll make some news, and I appreciate it always when you make news on the UUHO. show. Thank you, Senator. Larry posts new excerpts of the show on YouTube every day. Just go to youtube.com forward slash the Larry Elder Show Radio and click on the subscribe button. Hey, Larry, what is up with Nancy Pelosi? This lady is calling the bill that the uh, Republican gentleman brought up for uh, police reform comparing it to murdering George Floyd all over again. What is wrong with that woman? How does she keep getting reelected year after year or time, um, you know, uh, time after time after time? I don't get it. The, The lady needs to retire, get voted out, impeached. I don't know, but she gotta go. Thanks, Larry. Love your job you do for us. None dare call her comment ruh, 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 racist. In other words, for something to happen, they're going to have to face the realities of police brutality, the realities of the need for justice in policing, and the recognition that there are many, many good people in in, um, law enforcement, but not all, and that we have to address those concerns. Uh, So when they admit that, and and have some suggestions that are worthy of consideration. But so far, they were trying to get away with murder, actually, the murder of George Floyd. So the bill crafted by the black Republican is akin to getting away with murder of George Floyd. Madam Speaker, let me ask you if I can right now about police reform. Obviously, a major issue as we see this wave of protests continuing across the across the country right now. You've echoed your Democratic colleagues who have said that the Republican bill is, in their words and in your words, unsalvageable. When you were speaking yesterday, you said that Republicans are, quote, trying to get away with murder, actually, the murder of George Floyd. Senate Republicans are demanding an apology for that statement. Will you apologize? Absolutely, positively not. Uh, The fact is, people say, I think you frankly in the press have given them far too much credit for a bill that does nothing. They're saying, well, you have your bill, they have theirs. Yeah, our bill does something, theirs does nothing. Is Tim Scott working in good faith, I guess? (laughs) I'm sorry? 
Well, we would hope Is Tim Scott working right. in good faith? Is this a good starting point? I'm talking about Mitch McConnell. I'm talking about Mitch McConnell. I'm talking about George Kirby. 888-971-GE. 888-971-7243. Really? You see, here's what's going on. The Democrats, of course, have trained a whole generation of people that they're victims, that they're owed something, and a certain percentage of them actually believes it. (laughs) Goes out in the streets. And they want to get some stuff because, after all, you're talking about inequality and how unfair everything is and how racist everything is and how institutionally racist everything is. So, all right. Get back to that in a second. Now, we post excerpts from today's show on my new YouTube channel. It's called YouTube.com. Just to find it, go to YouTube.com slash The Larry Elder Show Radio. YouTube.com slash the Larry Elder Show Radio. And please click on subscribe. Everybody, all right now, drop everything you're doing unless you're driving and go to youtube.com slash the Larry Elder Show and click on subscribe. You didn't do it. I see you right now. You haven't moved since I said this. Okay, I know where you live. Now, Chicago. Chicago has a black female mayor, first black female mayor, first black female gay mayor. Have a black uh, police chief. Their title is police superintendent. All this left wing firepower in Chicago. Think about it. I mean, the crowd is there. Rahm Emanuel used to be the chief of staff to. Barack Obama, former mayor of Chicago, brother of Ari Emanuel, of William Morris Endeavor, brother of Ezekiel Emanuel, one of the architects of Obamacare. They got Father Flager, well known. Anti gun, anti Second Amendment priest. They've got Bill Ayers, the former Weather Underground guy whose living room was where Obama launched his political career. He's a renowned educator. Farrakhan, Jesse Jackson. Oh, a fellow named Barack Obama lives there. Valerie Jarrett. You'd think Chicago would be a shining city on a hill. Now, these are uncertain times we're all trying to navigate, and I've been talking about my friends at Rush Tax Resolution for years. And if you still haven't called them, I'm telling you, now is the perfect time. You see, to help people during the pandemic, the IRS just announced what they've called their People First Initiative. And if you're struggling with unresolved tax issues, there will never be a better time to put an end to them. Right now, the IRS is mandated to offer as much relief to taxpayers as possible, but the clock is ticking. Program in July 15. You're crazy to try to deal with the IRS on your own. Under the new initiative, the pros at Rush Tax have been able to negotiate harder than ever with the IRS, and they're seeing some of the most incredible resolutions ever. With their unbelievable zero BBB complaint history, Rush Tax is the only one I trust, the only one I recommend. So call right now, 800 8 or RushTaxResolution.com, RushTaxResolution.com. If you could do one thing that changed you forever, would you? How about something extraordinary? A bucket list item packing years of memories into 10 exciting days. Chart a new path by joining Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Set a clear new vision for yourself this year and join me on the Stand with Israel tour this December 2nd to 11th. Along with special guest Mike Lindell. God freed me from these and other addictions and started me on a path to a restored heart. Praise Jesus. Discover over 40 iconic sites as you encounter the life-changing impact of a journey to the Holy Land. Surrounded by like-minded travelers, picture yourself stepping foot in key locations right out of history. 
Much more than a vacation, this journey guides you through one of the most politically and spiritually significant places in the world. Explore Jerusalem, Galilee, the Dead Sea region, and so much more. Along the way, Dr. Sebastian Gorka will broadcast live and on-site as you watch and participate. Reserve your spot today for this incredible journey. Call today to join Dr. Sebastian Gorka on this life-enriching Israel tour, December 2nd to 11th, 2020. Call 855-565-5519 or book online at standwithisraeltour.com. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. Bubba gets um, Don Lemon and defends himself. He doesn't say, isn't this wonderful? See, if a, a decent man, and I don't know him from Adam, but I can only say a decent man would have said, I am so relieved. If I found uh, something anti-Semitic in my workplace, do you know how relieved I would be to, to learn it was not, in fact, anti-Semitic at all? That I had misapprehended what it was? Why isn't he relieved for himself, for NASCAR, and for the country? Tell me why. Why does this not indict his character? I, I, I would almost pay for somebody who wants to defend his decency to call in now. 1-8-Prager-776. 877 Leftism makes you a worse human being. Black, white, biracial, L, G, B, T, Q, Cisgender, non-gender. Say, every American needs to watch your film. Maybe they'd wake up. Maybe they'd wake up like Uncle Joe. I found out where Hunter is. He's hiding in his dad's basement. That's where he's at. He can't even talk either. That's a talkless family, if you ask me. You have a great word, Jay, and you... Keep up the good work, sir. You look more relaxed without a tie on, too, by the way. Hi, Larry. This is Sally in Loomis, California. I was feeling pretty down uh, yesterday afternoon, and then I listened to your show. You had me laughing out loud in the first 10 minutes. It was just great. Then I watched Uncle Tom, and it was so good. I can't wait to receive the DVD to share with friends who need to see it. You're the best, Larry. Love you. Thanks for everything you do. Ah, 888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243. Larry Elder, ReliefFactor.com studio. Next hour, we'll be speaking with Leo Hanian about the additions to our debt deficit. I told you during 2016, during the race, no matter who won, the debt and deficit were going to go up because neither Hillary nor Trump talked about reigning and spending night in any serious way. And until we get our hands around the three major entitlements programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, we're just, we're just joking around. And there's no political will to do anything about it. You do anything at all to change um, health care, and the media will find somebody who will be affected. You can always find somebody. And I told you that Obamacare was just one giant leap towards single payer, which is what the goal is anyway. Obama said if he were starting over, he'd, if he was starting from scratch, he'd have single payer. That's always been their goal. Harry Reid said so publicly. Admitted that you couldn't do it in one fell swoop. They have to do it step by step, but we're going to get there. Because they believe health care is a right. And they have such confidence in the federal government's ability to do things. Except when they don't. So that's where, that's where it is. And as a result, the idea that we get back to pay for services? Are you kidding me? Thomas Sowell told me that when he and his wife had their first child, he didn't have money for health insurance. 
and he got a bill from the hospital and he paid it over time. Not uncommon. Now, healthcare is one of the, if not the most heavily regulated industry in this country. And the more you regulate something, the more inefficiencies there are. Not saying we ought not have regulations against force, against fraud, against theft, against deceit. But regulating the kind of services, what kind, who gets what, where, how, and based on, 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 on gender and age and all this stuff are bunch of bureaucrats making these kinds of decisions inevitably inevitably will make things less efficient. But there's no will for that. And the whole concept of Social Security, I mean, think about it. The government thinks you're too stupid to set aside enough money, so we're going to take out a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit until you get to be 65 years old, and then we'll give it back to you when you're 70, 65, and uh, your rate of return will be Nothing like what it would have been had you taken the money and put it in the stock market in a, in a mutual fund. Not even close. And once you die, it goes poof. Unlike what would have happened had you put this in some sort of account. When you die, it goes to your heirs. But there's no will for that. During the race when Geraldine Ferraro was on the ticket. Was it 1984? And she was asked, it was, a, was, was something of an issue, the possible partial privatization of Social Security. And she said, well, if you lack the knowledge and wherewithal, you're just out of luck. You're just too stupid to manage your own money. You're not too stupid to bring a child into the world. No regulations on that. That often awesome responsibility. But we just think you're just too foolish, and so therefore you're not, we would never give you that kind of power. Same people that go around screaming at all about income inequality. That would be a mechanism to generate wealth for people at the lower ends. Far more effectively than social programs, government programs. But we're not even having that discussion, are we? And the whole concept of federal government welfare Presidents used to veto Congress granting money for this constituent and that constituent. Used to veto this, veto legislation like that time after time after time. James Monroe was the fifth president. He lived in Virginia. And Congress allocated money to expand the Cumberland Road. And that expansion would benefit the state of Virginia. And James Monroe cast his only veto of his presidency against it. He said, what right does one state have of taxing the citizens of another state for a project in that particular state? I find no warrant for it in the Constitution. That's how the Constitution used to be read. But there's no appetite for that. I got fact check when I was on some program and I said government in 1900 at all three levels took less than 10% from the American people. That must have flabbergasted somebody because I got a call from one of these fact check people. Do you have any any, any source on that? Oh, no, I just pulled it out of my you-know-what. Went on national television and just said it. No source. I gave them the source, and they fact checked me. And they came back, and they said, Elder Elder was right. In 1900, all three levels, think about that, all three levels, federal, state, and local, combined, government took less than 10% from the American people. That number now is close to 32, 35%. And far higher if you put a value on mandates as when the government tells you to do something, whether you want to or not, tells you you have to buy something, whether you think you ought to or not, you're running a business. Or mandates you have to buy something more expensive than you think is necessary. The difference between what you think is necessary and what the government is making you buy could legitimately be called a cost. So you take combine the amount of money the government takes at all three levels, federal, state, and local right now, and put some sort of number on these unfunded mandates, whether state or local, and government at all three levels takes around half of what the American people produce. Half. And you wonder why it is that we're bouncing around at 3%, 4% GDP growth, and that's a big deal now. It was not uncommon to have years where the growth was 5 6 
50%, even more. Before income tax, of course. Before all these regulations. Now, regarding relief factor, here's what Nancy in Texas said. Just came back from Texas. I love relief factor, and I can do more now. Yay! After teaching riding lessons and taking care of my five horses daily, I used to be so tired. Now I can just keep on going, getting more yard work, more housework, more cooking done now. And I have more stamina because I don't hurt. Feels so good to be able to do more like I used to do. It did take a couple of months on Relief Factor for me to really notice the huge difference. It happened slowly for me. Luckily, I just kept taking it, and the improvement is absolutely amazing. Thank you, Relief Factor. What about you? Consider the three-week quick start a trial pack. It can be at your door in a couple of days. Let's face it, getting older, exercise, just every, everyday living can create pain. Well, do something about it. ReliefFactor.com, ReliefFactor.com, 800-500-8384, 800-500-8384. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Hey there, folks. This is the Eric Metaxas Show, and I am talking to my friend Larry Elder, who has made a film called Uncle Tom, UncleTom.com. In these crazy times, boy, folks, you need to see this film. Uh, Larry, let's talk about what's happening in the country right now. Speaking as as a black man, uh, what do you say to people in my, in my audience who, some of whom are t- tremendously confused by this. And I think it's because of white guilt. Uh, it's a combination of white guilt, a combination of Trump derangement syndrome, and a combination of, I think, coronavirus cabin fever because people have been locked up for a couple of months. So it's sort of a perfect storm. And I must also say a bunch of young people have been indoctrinated by what I call the access of indoctrination that is Hollywood academia and media that have told them that they are a victim, that racism uh, and sexism and whatever uh, ism you want remain major factors in American life when none of these things uh, is significant anymore. Racism has never been uh, a more insignificant factor in success in American life. If Obama, I thought when Obama got elected in 2008, we put a fork in the idea that there was institutional racism. And you're looking at all these uh, things that are going on right now in America. Uh, in, uh, in Baltimore in 2015, when Freddie Gray uh, died in police custody, he's the one whose head hit that ban. You're talking about a city that's about 50 percent black. The mayor was black. The number one and number two people running the police department were black. The, si- the state attorney that brought the charges against the six officers was black. Three of the six officers were black. The judge before whom two of the officers tried their cases, by the way, and found them not guilty, was black. Uh, All of city council was Democrat, majority black. Uh, The U.S. attorney at the time, Loretta Lynch, was black. And the president of the United States was black. We're talking about institutional racism. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. The Dixie Chicks bravely changed their name yesterday to just the Chicks. They're so brave. Boy, they're standing tall, aren't they? Yeah, this is to our president, and now Mr. It's time- president Trump. No, you're not beaten. They want to say that to make other people believe that you're beaten and that you're weak and all that. Hey, no matter what, I'm a Democrat. I'm behind you. I'm, I got your back. And I'm telling everybody, Democrats, Republicans, independents, snails, I don't care. You ain't beaten, dude. They just want us to believe that. They're beaten. Look at what they're coming out with. Your son, really? Jeez, they have to pick on him? Man, what kind of people bore these people and raised them? They're animals. Not even animals. I insulted animals. They're snails. They're scargo. Thank you. Love your show. Have a good day.
This is Lon Hee Chen of the Hoover Institution for townhall.com. Public health officials across America have spent the last several months warning about the dangers of the coronavirus and the need for us to stay at home, halt economic activity, and avoid social interactions with our friends and neighbors. We are now reopening our economy in many parts of the country, but these same public health officials have compromised their own credibility as we do so. On the one hand, they've urged caution and a slow return to work, school, and faith gatherings. They've criticized those who oppose the stay-at-home orders. But at the same time, these officials have been broadly supportive of the large protests on America's streets in the last few weeks. Public health officials should be helping us understand the comparative risks of activities, not endorsing the causes they like while prohibiting the ones they don't. Their hypocrisy is costly indeed. They have impacted our ability to address future health crises. I'm Lon He Chen. ADF, fighting for those whose liberties are being violated. If you could do one thing that changed you forever, would you? How about something extraordinary? A bucket list item packing years of memories into 10 exciting days. Chart a new path by joining Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Set a clear new vision for yourself this year and join me on the Stand with Israel tour this December 2nd to 11th. Along with special guest Mike Lindell. God freed me from these and other addictions and started me on a path to a restored heart. Praise Jesus. Discover over 40 iconic sites as you encounter the life-changing impact of a journey to the Holy Land. Surrounded by like-minded travelers, picture yourself stepping foot in key locations right out of history. Much more than a vacation, this journey guides you through one of the most politically and spiritually significant places in the world. Explore Jerusalem, Galilee, the Dead Sea region, and so much more. Along the way, Dr. Sebastian Gorka will broadcast live and on-site as you watch and participate. Reserve your spot today for this incredible journey. Call today to join Dr. Sebastian Gorka on this life-enriching Israel tour, December 2nd to 11th, 2020. Call 855-565-5519 or book online at StandWithIsraelTour.com. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. Bubba gets um, Don Lemon and defends himself. He doesn't say, isn't this wonderful? See, if a, a decent man, and I don't know him from Adam, but I can only say a decent man would have said, I am so relieved. If I found uh, something anti-Semitic in my workplace, do you know how relieved I would be to, to learn it was not, in fact, anti-Semitic at all? That I had misapprehended what it was? Why isn't he relieved for himself, for NASCAR, and for the country? Tell me why. Why does this not indict his character? I, I, I.
the Chicago Police Superintendent David Brown said this, and I'm quoting, I struggle to make sense of the reckless gun violence that continues to take the lives of young people throughout the city. What I want to talk about are the guns that we weren't able to get to on time. The guns and the cowards behind those guns that caused a senseless loss of life over the past weekend, end of quote. The guns. He's making the same argument, of course, has been made by the left forever. It's not the behavior. It's the guns. Father Flegger is a prominent Chicago figure. And he once threatened the murder of gun owners. The parish even criticized him for what he said. You don't think young men living in the suburbs has any more difficulty getting a firearm than somebody living in the inner city? Presumably they've got more money. Therefore able to literally just buy a gun from somebody rather than stealing it. I struggle to make sense. I remember Maxine Waters was once asked by a young man who has an urban was an urban show, city show. And he asked her why she wouldn't come on my program and she gave the same answer she gave Gloria Allred. I'm just an entertainer. I don't I don't fool around with just entertainers. And then he asked her why she thought there was so much violence, gun violence in the inner city. And she said, I, I, I don't really know. I, I, I really don't know. I, I, just, I just know that we need to. I don't know. During the Great Depression, unemployment for black men, twice what it was for whites, at, its, at, at, at the worst possible point during the Great Depression, it was 50%. Unemployment for blacks, black men, 50%. If economic difficulty is what's causing the violence, how come we didn't have this kind of prison population then? How come we didn't have these kind of drive-by shootings then? Okay, people didn't have cars. I struggle to make sense. You have no idea. So, when Obama said, as I've said many, many times, a kid raised without a father is five times more likely to be poor and commit crime. Five times. Nine times more likely to drop out of school. Twenty times more likely to end up in jail. Now, you're not, you don't find any connection between the large number of these kids raised without fathers and this kind of violence that you say you have no idea why it's going on? Here's a PragerU video I did. Years ago, I interviewed Kwesi Nfume, then the president of the NAACP. As between the presence of white racism and the absence of black fathers, I asked him, which poses the bigger threat to the black community? Without missing a beat, he said, the absence of black fathers. It was President Barack Obama who said, we all know these statistics, that children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. The Journal of Research on Adolescence confirms that even after controlling for varying levels of household income, kids in father-absent homes are more likely to end up in jail, and kids who never had a father in the house are the most likely to wind up behind bars. In 1960, 5% of America's children entered the world without a mother and father married to each other. By 1980, it was 18%. By 2000, it had risen to 33%, and 15 years later, the number reached 41%. For blacks, even during slavery when marriage for slaves was illegal, black children were more likely than today to be raised by both their mother and father. 
Economist Walter Williams has written that, according to census data from 1890 to 1940, a black child was more likely to grow up with married parents than a white child. For blacks, out-of-wedlock births have gone from 25% in 1965 to 73% in 2015. For whites, from less than 5% to over 25%. And for Hispanics, out-of-wedlock births have risen to 53%. What happened to fathers? The answer is found in a basic law of economics. If you subsidize undesirable behavior, you will get more undesirable behavior. In 1949, the nation's poverty rate was 34%. By 1965, it was cut in half to 17%, all before President Lyndon Johnson's so-called War on Poverty. But after that war began in 1965, poverty began to flatline. From 1965 until now, the government has spent over $20 trillion to fight poverty. The poverty rate has remained unchanged, but the relationship between poor men and women has changed dramatically. That's because our generous welfare system allows women, in effect, to marry the government. And this makes it all too easy for men to abandon their traditional moral and financial responsibilities. Psychologists call such dependency learned helplessness. How do we know that the welfare state creates disincentives that hurt the very people we're trying to help? They tell us. In 1985, the Los Angeles Times asked both the poor and the non-poor whether poor women often have children to get additional benefits. Most of the non-poor respondents said no. However, 64% of poor respondents said yes. Now, who do you think is in a better position to know? Tupac Shakur, the late rapper, once said, I know for a fact that had I had a father, I'd have some discipline, I'd have more confidence. He admitted he began running with gangs because he wanted the things a father gives to a child, especially to a boy. Structure and protection. Your mother cannot calm you down the way a man can, Shakur said. You need a man to teach you how to be a man. In my book, Dear Father, Dear Son, I write about my rough, tough World War II Marine Staff Sergeant Dad. Born in the Jim Crow South of Athens, Georgia, he was 14 at the start of the Great Depression. Growing up, I watched my father work two full-time jobs as a janitor. He also cooked for a rich family on the weekends and somehow managed to go to night school to get his GED. When I was 10, my father opened a small restaurant that he ran until he retired in his mid-80s. He was never angry or bitter and insisted that today's America was very different from the world of racial segregation and limited opportunity in which he grew up. Hard work wins, he told me and my brothers. You get out of life what you put into it. You can't control the outcome, but you are 100% in control of the effort. When we come back, economist Leo Hanian on the threat of massive, massive inflation. I am Larry Elder. You're listening to The Larry Elder Show. Trending now on The Hugh Hewitt Show. General Flynn has been exonerated. He did not lie. He pled to a lie in order to save his son. General Flynn has his reputation back, but he doesn't have three years of his life back. Flynn got justice yesterday. Donald Trump talked about it yesterday. Happy about General Flynn. He was treated horribly. He was treated very, very horribly by a group of very bad people. And I think you'll see things are going to start to come out. But what happened to General Flynn should never happen again in our country. He was persecuted, and many other people were persecuted. They spied on a campaign, and they should never spy on a campaign, to put it mildly. It never happened before in the history of our country. The Obama administration spied on a campaign. Why is that Donald Trump the only one to speak the truth clearly about this? The Obama administration, through James Comey, Andrew McKay, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, and others, spied on the Trump campaign. Then they sabotaged the Trump transition. Then they sabotaged the first two and a half years of the Trump administration. All on a trumped up charge. All because of Comey. 
who was a bad guy. He's a bad guy. If you will understand that. And Joe Biden knew. That's the whole thing you need to know is Joe Biden knew. Joe Biden's in the basement because he doesn't want to have a press conference where people ask him about these handwritten notes that show he's in the meeting when they talk about this. Joe Biden knew it all. Joe Biden knew about the spying. He knew about the plan. He knew that Comey was a rotten guy. Joe Biden knew. And he wants to be your president so he can use the FBI again as a plaything to get you if you oppose him. Stay tuned. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Eric Metaxas Show. Hey there, folks. It's The Eric Metaxas Show. And I am talking to my friend Larry Elder, who has made a film called Uncle Tom, UncleTom.com. In these crazy times, boy, folks, you need to see this film. Uh, Larry, let's talk about what's happening in the country right now. Speaking as, as a black man, uh, it, what do you say to people in my, in my audience, who some of whom are tremendously confused by this, and I think it's because of white guilt? Uh, it's a combination of white guilt, a combination of Trump derangement syndrome, and a combination of, I think, coronavirus cabin fever because people have been locked up for a couple of months. So it's sort of a perfect storm. And I must also say a bunch of young people have been indoctrinated by what I call the access of indoctrination. And it's Hollywood academia and media that have told them that they are a victim, that racism uh, and sexism and whatever uh, ism you want remain major factors in American life when none of these things uh, is significant anymore. Racism has never been uh, a more insignificant factor in success in American life. If Obama, I thought when Obama got elected in 2008, he put a fork in the idea that there was institutional racism. And you're looking at all these uh, things that are going on right now in America. Uh, in, uh, in Baltimore in 2015, when Freddie Gray uh, died in police custody, he's the one whose head hit that ban. You're talking about a city that's about 50 percent black. The mayor was black. The number one and number two people running the police department were black. The, the state attorney that brought the charges against the six officers was black. Three of the six officers were black. The judge before whom two of the officers tried their cases, by the way, and found them not guilty, was black. Uh, all of city council was Democrat, majority black. Uh, the U.S. attorney at the time, Loretta Lynch, was black. And the president of the United States was black. And we're talking about institutional racism. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. The Dixie Chicks. I mean, I know a lot of this blackface thing is, but, you know, my grandmother played in the um, big bands, and Al Jolson, she loves his songs, and, you know, that's my question. How far should we apologize? I always thought, I was taught that flattery, imitation, is like the biggest way of flattery, but it doesn't seem to be that way right now, and I was just wondering your opinion on it, because, you know, I really respect your opinion. Thank you. Man, can you imagine how many actors we're going to have to dig up and chastise burt lancaster played a movie uh played a uh, mexican bandit no no mexican guy who was out to get revenge from what bandits did to his family it's called valdez is coming you tell him valdez is coming burt lancaster now you've helped build my pillow into the amazing company it is today mike lindell the inventor of and ceo of my pillow wants to give back not only is he making face masks and giving them free to hospitals around the country, he's also offering discounts for you. Buy one, get one free on a variety of products. Just go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio listener specials. And if you buy Mike Lindell's book, What Are the Odds? From Crack Addict to CEO, you're going to get free shipping and a $25 gift card. Just go to MyPillow.com, enter promo code Larry, or call 800-890-1843. Be sure and use promo code Larry. My next guest is the esteemed economist from UCLA. And I sent uh, him an article that I read by Tom Campbell. Tom Campbell is the former, I think he's five-term congressman from California. He's also a professor of economics. And uh, he wrote a piece about the 
$3 trillion we've just added to the national debt in the last few months. And he says the money supply has increased by 24% over the last year, but real growth in the economy, by contrast, has been negative. And he ends this column this way, quote, it gives politicians theoretic cover to do what they most like to do, cut taxes and spend money. It is unrealistic to suppose there will be some political will to raise taxes when inflation occurs tomorrow. I fear, I fear a substantial amount of inflation lies ahead of us, and no one is sounding the alarm. We're going to talk to our next guest about all of this. He is professor of economics from UCLA, Leo Hanian. <laughs> professor, as always, thank you very much for taking the time. Now, you have been warning about inflation, uh, and I think this, uh, this guy, this professor of economics, uh, Tom Campbell, pretty much sees the, sees the world the way you see it. Yes, his, his piece is right on the money, Larry. Um, there's uh, people like Bernie Sanders and AOC have been during press conferences when talking about programs like the Green New Deal, which are you know, many, many, many trillion dollars of programs. People will ask them, well, how do you pay for this? And AOC has gone as far to say, well, we really have to get outside of the narrow minded view that public spending has to be financed with taxes. Now, that was literally her verbatim quote, Mm -hmm. that we can just make things appear out of air. And it's this idea called modern monetary theory, which is the government can print money, and voila, you know, fairy tale time, we can produce goods and services out of the government printing worthless paper money. So Campbell is right to be worried about inflation in the future. And um, within Congress, it's really hard to find anyone who is worried about how much inflation we might have, about the rising federal debt, about the upcoming difficulties we have with Medicare and with Social Security. Um, so it's, 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 it's a real problem and no one is talking about it. And Campbell is right on the money about that. So it is, it is something we need to, it is something policymakers need to be discussing, but, um, but thus far it's just crickets. P- Professor, is some of the blame on some of the experts, uh, uh, people like yourself, uh, because the, the predictions of the inflation haven't happened. And so I think a lot of people uh, have now decided, well, these guys just didn't know what the hell they were talking about. We can do quantitative easing and we're not getting any inflation. So why should I listen to people like Leo Hanian anymore? So what happened 10 years ago is that the Fed provided a ton of liquidity and most of it went into the banking sector and it stayed there. So if you just look at the headlines, people think, wow, the money supply grew a lot, and we didn't have inflation. Now, we also didn't have that burst of growth that people thought quantitative easing would produce. Mm -hmm. What standard economic theory tells us is that once money gets into circulation and is being spent on goods and services, that's when inflation goes up. Mm -hmm. So um, I understand why people think, oh, yeah, we we print a lot of money. And inflation didn't occur, so let's let's do it again. The precise reason why inflation didn't occur is because that money just sat in the banking sector, and it didn't get out in the system. What people like AOC and Bernie are talking about is literally printing money and not letting it sit in the banking system, but rather letting it be used to pay for contractors and engineers and steel and aluminum and all the stuff, the resources that are used to, say, produce the Green New Deal. And that would just be a complete disaster. And it is incredibly dangerous to think that inflation just will never appear no matter what you do. But that is the song that is being sung right now in a lot of quarters, including Bernie Sanders, AOC, and many, many other progressives. My guest is Professor Leo Hanian. He teaches economics at UCLA, author of many books and publications, including Macroeconomics, a Neoclassical Perspective. In this article, Professor, uh, Tom Campbell predicts that inflation could get as high as 18.4% this year or soon thereafter. Um. Hard to, it's very hard to predict the short-run mm-hmm. aspects of, of inflation. I'm not trying to deduct the question, but just empirically, it's really, really hard. And it's also really hard because once, once, markets, once markets think the jig is up, 
then inflation can just take off. You know, you just you take a look at Greece a few years ago. Everything was fine, and then one day, boom. One day, interest rates on Greek debt just skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because markets knew. Markets got to the point where they understood that the ability and the will of the Greek government to honor their obligations had been surpassed. So once that point happens, inflation can be 20, 30, 40, 50%. It's, just, it's very hard to know when that point comes. I don't think we're close to the United States, but it is absolutely ridiculous to think that that never will happen no matter how much debt we create. And the United States, the United States is still the most creditworthy government among all Western democracies, but every single one has a limit. Mm-hmm. They all have a limit, and when that limit is reached, interest rates skyrocket. Suddenly, a government is saying, we can't pay the debt off, and then interest rates rise more, and then the government defaults, and the only way they can make the, make, make the books balance is by simply just printing money. We've seen that happen hundreds of times in the history. Of, of the world, including, you know, a few years ago in places 20, like 20, Argentina 20, 20, and Brazil. 20 seconds, Professor. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've seen that happen just hundreds of times. And I have no idea what people think when they say, oh, it'll never happen here, it'll never happen here. It is just the most dangerous economic um, discussion I've seen in just in a long, long time. So I hope, I hope uh, policymakers come to their senses about this. Professor of Economics at UCLA, Leo Haney, and Professor, as always, thank you very much for taking the time. We appreciate it. Thank you, Larry. If you could do one thing that changed you forever, would you? How about something extraordinary? A bucket list item packing years of memories into 10 exciting days. Chart a new path by joining Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Set a clear new vision for yourself this year and join me on the Stand with Israel tour this December 2nd to 11th. Along with special guest Mike Lindell. God freed me from these and other addictions and started me on a path to a restored heart. Praise Jesus. Discover over 40 iconic sites as you encounter the life-changing impact of a journey to the Holy Land. Surrounded by like-minded travelers, picture yourself stepping foot in key locations right out of history. Much more than a vacation, this journey guides you through one of the most politically and spiritually significant places in the world. Explore Jerusalem, Galilee, the Dead Sea region, and so much more. Along the way, Dr. Sebastian Gorka will broadcast live and on-site as you watch and participate. Reserve your spot today for this incredible journey. Call today to join Dr. Sebastian Gorka on this life-enriching Israel tour, December 2nd to 11th, 2020. Call 855-565-5519 or book online at StandWithIsraelTour.com. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. Bubba gets um, Don Lemon and defends himself. He doesn't say, isn't this wonderful? See, if a, a decent man, and I don't know him from Adam, but I can only say a decent man would have said, I am so relieved. If I found uh, something anti-Semitic in my workplace, do you know how relieved I would be to to learn it was not, in fact, anti-Semitic at all? That I had misapprehended what it was? Why isn't he relieved for himself, for NASCAR, and for the country? Tell me why. Why does this not indict his character? I, I, I would almost pay for somebody who wants to defend his decency to call in now. 1-8-Prager-776. 877-243-7776. Leftism makes you a worse human being. Black, white, biracial, L, G, B, T, Q, Cisgender, non-gender, transgender, G, 
Jew, Christian, atheist, secularist, Mormon, Buddhist, get it? Whatever you are, leftism makes you worse. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. What is your response to the uh, the so-called national anthem issue, Trish? You know what? It's it's so wrong. It's misplaced, um, and it's very hypocritical. That's what I would say, Seb. Look, it's not an easy song to sing. Trust no. me. I mean the. America, we have a country to save. And now, here's Larry Elder. Yes, dear Larry, the great one, Muhammad Ali, has a famous quote from when he came home from fighting Joe Frazier in Zaire. When he came home to America and he seen the conditions in Zaire, he said, I sure am happy my grandpappy was on that boat. I sure wish a lot of people would pay to the great one, Muhammad Ali. IMDB with about 200 written reviews, and the reviews have just been spectacular. Overall, on a scale from 1 to 10, Uncle Tom on IMDB is getting a 9.9. 9.9. Here's one. This letter from Chris. Just finished Uncle Tom. It was absolutely phenomenal. Best documentary I've seen in the last three years. I'm so glad to see this movement on the screen. Finally, you've made me you make me proud to be a veteran and an American. This one is from E. Mr. Elder wanted to write and thank you for giving us this film. I tried to tweet our appreciation, but my tweet was blocked. I gather because it had Uncle Tom in the body of the text. Be that as it may, thank you. My family sat down tonight and watched as a family. Although we were aware of the history, the film still brought us on a journey of anger, disgust, sadness, to hope and promise. We all stand together. Evil cannot flourish in the sunshine of truth. This one is from Marty, retired school teacher, Hawaii. I just finished watching your movie, Uncle Tom, and it was a home run. Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, and you have been my mentors for years now. Candace is brilliant. I was recently dubbed a racist by the majority of my family who is mixed racially. One of my nieces has even been radicalized by Black Lives Matter, and many of my family marches with Black Lives Matter. They have no idea who or what they are supporting. Just wanted to thank you so much for your film. It gives us hope. It really has been gratifying to get this reaction. 888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243. Corey is in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Corey, you're on the Larry Yelda Show. Thank you so much for calling. I appreciate it. Uh, how you doing? Hello. Well, my, my thing is, Larry, I, I understand where you're coming from. I listen to you. I respect you. I don't always agree with what you have to say. But I get very disappointed because sometimes it very much seems like you bash black people. You know, and I don't understand that because if you look at the history of America, there's more white men that has done wrong to black men than black men have done wrong to white men. Corey, Corey, do I bash white people? I haven't heard it. Really? I've never never said said anything at all negative about Hillary. Never said anything at all negative about Joe Biden. Never said anything at all negative about the Clintons. Never said anything at all negative well, about, I, about left-wing well, people on, on the I Democratic agree. side. Never I said anything agree. at all negative about Chuck Schumer. You're Nothing right. negative about Nancy Pelosi. You're right. You're right. You're right. I, I never looked at... I never and, and see, Cor- and Corey, Corey, Corey the people I criticize... I'm not, I'm not a Hillary supporter. Cor- Corey, so. the, Corey, the people I criticize who are black are lefties. 
You've never heard me criticize Candace Owens. You never heard me criticize Peter Kersenow. You never heard me criticize Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, DeRoy Murdoch, Peter Kersenow. I criticize left wing people, Corey. I hear what you're saying. I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. But the people that you are naming, uh, in my opinion, they're not too friendly to black people either. Candace Owens is not accepted by most black people. Well, not, not accepted and being friendly are two different things. As Corey, you haven't, seen well, my, you, you, saying, you haven't seen my movie, Uncle Tom, but when you see it, you'll hear Candace I, Owens I, say... I'm definitely going to see it. I'm, def- I'm definitely going to see I, it. I sure tonight. hope so, because when I'm you... Off tonight, I'm definitely going to look at it. I, I appreciate it, Corey. And when you see it, pay attention to something that Candace Owens said about you're saying she's not accepted by black people. She says, I'm an alarm clock. I'm not here to win a popularity contest. I'm here to say, wake up. You're losing. Wake up. And when your alarm clock goes off, you're angry at first, but eventually you get up and do what you have to do. That was her analogy. I thought it was brilliant. I I hear what you're saying, my man. I just, uh, like I said, we can agree to disagree. But like I said before, so the comment that I made, Mm -hmm. there are more white men that have done harm to black people than black men have done harm to white people. No no doubt. And you know that. No, No doubt. But right now, right now, who's doing the harm? Right now. Out of half the homicides in this I country, agree. Corey, half of them are black people. Who's doing it? Black people I killing agree. other black people. It's not, it's not the white man doing it. I can't even argue that with you because you're telling the truth. All right, Corey. Thank you very much for calling. I appreciate it. Look, I, this, this, is, this, is, this is what's going on here. And I, I get that a lot. Well, you're putting down black people. Well, I'm putting down certain black people. I'm putting down Al Sharpton. I'm putting down Jesse Jackson. I'm putting down Farrakhan. I'm putting down left-wing people that use the race car to divide people and to stir people up so they march in there like lemmings and pull that lever for the Democratic Party. That's the people I criticize. I criticize Jason Riley, the one that writes for the Wall Street Journal, wrote the book called Please Stop Helping. Have I criticized him? Have I criticized Alveda King, who I had on the show the other day? I mean, honestly. You to ease up off the black man, Larry. <laughs> Gary in California says, I cannot thank you enough. I am 62 years old and have just started taking Relief Factor. I have never felt better and will recommend to all my baby boomer friends. Debran, I just started taking Relief Factor four days ago. My hip pain is gone. I had a horrible time sleeping because of the pain. I absolutely love now how I am feeling. Thank you so much. What about you? Three week quick start can be at your door in a couple of days. ReliefFactor.com, ReliefFactor.com, or call 800-583-84, Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Folks, I'm talking to my friend Larry Elder, who... Uh, has produced a glorious film called Uncle Tom, UncleTom.com. Larry Elder, who are some of the figures that appear in this film? I mentioned a couple of them a moment ago. You mentioned Carol Swain. She was a law professor at Vanderbilt uh, in Tennessee, cut all sorts of grief because she, among other things, opposed race-based preferences, argued that they actually hurt black people uh, because you're putting them on a track much faster than they could handle. They would have been perfectly uh, fine at a lesser competitive school, but because we decided that there ought to be some sort of racial mixture at a given school, whether the kid can do the work or not. We've also got Herman Cain in there. Uh, Herman Cain uh, was, of course, maligned as an Uncle Tom and a sellout when he ran, because by definition, any black person who's a Republican is an Uncle Tom and a sellout, never mind the skanky history of the Democratic Party, which, by the way, we go over in the film, uh, I think, pretty thoroughly. The Democratic Party, of course, is a party of slavery. Uh, Democrats unanimously oppose the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment. Larry, Democrats- I just want to interrupt. When, when people say stuff like what you're saying right now, I always have to hit pause and say, Nobody knows this. It can't be right that the Democrats are the party of slavery and the KKK. And in your film, you cover a lot of this. Another reason people need to go see Uncle Tom, the film. This movie was about one of my liberal friends saw it and said, I'm surprised. I thought Uncle Tom was going to be a kind of an autobiography about you. I said, that would have been boring. I'm barely in the movie, as you know. Uh, And he said, you're not telling people what to think. You're saying in America, you are free to think for yourself without being maligned as somebody who's a self-loather. That's all the movie asks. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka.
are we witnessing simply 1968 redux or is this a far more cynical um shell game whereby the left the institutional left says we have no way to win the election on policy platforms so we're going to use uh, violence on the streets and that's going to be a feint or a dodge is, is are these people sincere professor or is this a political play well it's being aided and abetted by the dnc and they see it as useful as a lot of uh, would-be architects of revolution do, they think it's useful to cause chaos or to pressure the blue states not to participate in the recovery or whatever their agenda for the November uh, election. And in that sense, uh, it's a little different. What I see is different from 68 is we didn't have mayors and governors actively resisting help from the federal Welcome back to the Larry Elder Show. Hey, Larry, I just wanted to tell you something I saw on Facebook today. I was checking my page and saw a tab on the right-hand side, or no, left-hand side, that said, uh, lift up black voices. And I'm like, oh, that's great. Maybe they're talking about Uncle Tom movie. Maybe they've got uh, a link to Blexit on there, lifting up black voices. So I clicked on there, and of course... <laughs> I, I I felt like I had walked into a page that I really shouldn't be on. It was so much propaganda and groups that I've never would never imagine. So um, yeah, I know what you're talking about with Facebook. Um, again, love the movie and keep I keep lifting up your voice. Thank you. Triple eight nine seven one S A G E triple eight nine seven one seven two four three Larry Elder ReliefFactor dot com studio. What's gotten into Leo Terrell? Oh my goodness. This is a guy who ran around for two years saying O.J. Simpson was innocent. Not that the police had failed to sustain their burden of proof, but that the man was innocent. It had nothing to do with it. And all of a sudden, I think he was bitten by a radioactive sp active spider. I don't know what happened to him. But here he is, actually showing logic and reason and common sense and judgment and using facts and data and not emotion. I want to talk to Joe in Philadelphia in just a second, a former prosecutor, about the assertion by the Chicago police superintendent that it's about the guns. Chicago weekend, 63 people shot, 16 fatally. And the Chicago police superintendent, David Brown, said, quote, I struggle to make sense of the reckless gun violence that continues to take the lives of our young people throughout the city. What I want to talk about are the guns that we weren't able to get to on time. Detroit police SUV drove into a crowd of protesters on Sunday evening after they surrounded the car, according to video of the internet shared on Twitter. Protesters can be heard screaming as they chase the car. After it briefly accelerated into a crowd of approximately 15 people before stopping, sending some protesters onto the ground and the hood of the car, according to the video. Once it stopped, it, it accelerated with people still on the hood, according to the video. Detroit PD did not respond to request to comment, but the police chief said the department would address the incident at a press conference today. Here's another story. Listen to this one. Protesters set up guillotine in front of Jeff Bezos' D.C. home. Why am I laughing? Protesters have set up a guillotine outside the Washington, D.C. complex where Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos reportedly resides. Digital flyer circulated online that apparently talked about this, this uh, event. Abolish the present, reconstruct our future. And it named his DC complex and advertised that there, that there would be an event there 
between 4 and 8 p.m. The message said, quote, Amazon works directly with police to surveil us, stoking racist fears in the name of profit. Doubling down on their union busting and mistreatment of workers, Amazon fired and racially slandered labor organizer Chris Smalls. Join us to tell Jeff Bezos enough is enough. So protesters went to his home and set up a guillotine outside his home. Here's one more before I go to Joe in Philadelphia. St. Louis couple draw weapons on protesters headed to mayor's house. A married couple brandished firearms at a group of protesters who marched through their upscale St. Louis neighborhood Sunday on their way to the home of the mayor. The male homeowner stood barefoot on his Renaissance style porch in Central West End neighborhood while carrying a semi automatic weapon. His wife pointed a pistol at the gathering. The couple confronted the group of around 300 protesters after they breached a gate in the neighborhood, according to a local NBC affiliate. Joe is in Philadelphia. He is a former prosecutor. Joe, thank you so much for calling. I appreciate it. Got it, Larry. Uh, Yo from Philadelphia. Wanted to comment on your guns comment. Prosecuted uh, homicide, ag assault, rape, robbery, etc. And guns were not the issue. The issue was the defendant. Mm-hmm. Lack of values, single mom on the streets. No values, no no church, no this, no that, and it was depressing. The defendant, the victims, had no chance, no education, mm-hmm. no values, and uh, it, it just recycled itself. Mm-hmm. So the guns are not the issue. If they had staff, sergeant elder as their father. They'd be running the country. So that's the comment, Larry. Well, Joe, thank you so much for, for calling. Thank you for your service to your country as a prosecutor. I got a letter from a man who said, I am a counselor in a correctional institute. And I counsel several men. He says, I'm white, and the people I counsel are almost always people of color. And he said, I will tell you that they believe that the only reason I got ahead is because I'm white. He said, they will tell me this until they are blue in the face. They are, they are convinced of it, that the only reason I got, got ahead in, the, in life, that I became a counselor, is because I'm white. What kind of mentality is that? And if that's what you think, you got no shot. Why try hard? No matter how hard you try, you're still going to be black. What about the thriving black working class and middle class? Most black people are not poor, you know. Most black people are not on welfare, you know. Most black people are not committing crimes, you know. AT&T, 76 bucks a month. Verizon Wireless, 83 bucks a month. Sprint, 92. That is what the average family of four is saving a month on their cell phone service by switching to Pure Talk USA. Looking to cut costs and free up cash on a monthly basis? Start today with Pure Talk USA. Pure Talk covers 99% of Americans. Their call center is based right here in America, and their chairman and CEO is a U.S. vet. He cares deeply about serving his country, and right now he's doing it by saving you money every month on your wireless bill. I'm a customer, and you should be too. Just dial pound 250 and say keyword Larry Elder for unlimited talk and unlimited text and two gigs of data for just $20 a month. Plus, you'll get 50% off your first month. Stop paying too much to big wireless providers. Switch to Pure Talk today and save 50% off your first month. Dial pound 250 and say keyword Larry Elder. Pound 250 keyword Larry Elder. Pure Talk USA, simply, smarter, wireless. (laughs) 
trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Folks, I'm talking to my friend Larry Elder, who uh, has produced a glorious film, which uh, I adjure you, A-D-J-U-R-E, I adjure you to see. <laughs> it's called Uncle Tom, UncleTom.com. As a black man in America, uh, thinking you know, along conservative lines, uh, clearly you suffered a different kind of persecution. I, I must say again, I never thought of myself as a victim. And that's even a victim of, of the kind of name calling that I get from black people. My mother always told me that nobody can make you feel inferior without your permission. And I've always felt that whenever I said something, I always had it, had it well thought out. It was always commonsensical. I always try to back it up with sources. And when you react with a vicious name, that means you're just out of ammo. And I feel bad for you because we're not having the debate. The problems in the black community have very little to do with, with white racism. I've always said, Eric, if you invented a vaccine to eliminate white racism, it's all, it's, now it's all gone. Are the major problems in the black community still present? Do we still have 70% of black kids raised without fathers? Yes. We still have 25% of young black boys having criminal records living in the inner city that's either uh, having been arrested in jail on parole or on probation. Uh, do we still have, a, in many of our urban high schools, a 50% urban dropout rate? And many of the kids, when they do graduate, can't read, write, and compute at grade level. I mean, we're talking about Baltimore, 13 high schools where 0% of kids, 0% Eric, can do math at grade level. When I raise these issues and you scream at me and call me an Uncle Tom, you're not having a debate that might very well improve the educational prospect of your own child. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now. America, we have a country to save. And now, Hi, Larry, here's this Larry is Elder. Elder. Calling from Minnesota. Uh, regarding the protest, I was around when, I'm living in Chicago, when Martin Luther King was killed and uh, Chicago was burned down, part, especially in the black neighborhoods. And um, stores boarded up. We had nowhere to shop. Okay, fast forward to now and look at Chicago. They're, they're worse off since the protests and the violence, nothing that did not help at all. It's worse. So I just wanted, I, that's some food for thought for that guy who thinks that property values will increase when protests happen. That's not true. Thanks, Larry. Thanks for all that you do. If this country doesn't give us what we want, then we will burn down this system and replace it. All right. And I could be speaking phys phys uh, figuratively. Okay. I could be speaking literally. It's a matter of interpretation. Like, let's be very real. And, and, and let's observe the history of the 1960s. When black people were rioting, we had the highest growth in wealth and property ownership. Think about the last few weeks. Since we started protesting, uh, there have been eight cops fired across the country. Fallujah must be a shining city on the hill then, if destruction means prosperity. You remember they were telling us that there was due process. That's why the cop that choked Eric Gardner to death had kept his job and make, get, received raises for five years. Anytime a cop hurt a woman, hurt a child, hurt pregnant people, hurt our elders, there was always a call for due process. You must wait. You must wait. But the moment people start destroying property, now cops can be fired automatically. What? What? What is this country uh, rewarding? What behavior is it listening to? Obviously not marching, but when people get aggressive and they escalate their their protests, the you country like listens. That's when you're getting Cops get fired. Now you have okay. now you have police officers, you have Republican politicians talking about police reform. I don't condone nor do I condemn rioting, but I'm just telling you what I observe. Sixty minutes rewind. Now what I'm saying is this, I would like for all of us to believe in nonviolence, but I'm here to say tonight that if every Negro in the United States turns against nonviolence, I'm going to stand up as a lone voice and say this is the wrong way. 
888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243, Larry Elder, ReliefFactor.com studio. Let's see. Mr. Uh, Black Lives Matter New York chapter, Chicago weekend, 63 shot, 16 fatally. Where's Black Lives Matter? More people shot, killed in Chicago year to year than last year, despite a stay-at-home directive that was in effect for almost two and a half months. Black Lives Matter, paging Black Lives Matter, paging Black Lives Matter. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. A dominant theme of everything that I write and and broadcast is behavior matters not thoughts you judge people by their thoughts that's what the left does by the way that is that is what the left does it's an this is all a product of the denial of reality oh my god what jimmy kimmel said that is so disgusting why because the the question isn't isn't is not was it disgusting? The question is, was it true? What is a normal heterosexual male supposed to think about a girl in a bikini and high heel shoes uh, under a waterfall? What a lovely bikini. Wonder where she got those high heels? Where'd you get your PhD that you find it so disgusting? What women's studies program taught you that this is uh, disgusting? Now, is it a problem? It sure is. Male sexuality is a problem. That is entirely correct. By the way, female emotions are a problem too. Both sexes have big battles with their natures. If you know one college that has taught that to its students or high school, the odds are, if it exists, it is a profoundly religious school. Most religious schools uh, are worthless, unfortunately. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Verka. I saw the the first video that went viral, but I didn't know until I watched Garen Thumb's video that that wasn't the only thing you did that day, and that was the second weapon that you retrieved from rioters who had broken into a patrol car. So tell us, tell us everything that happened prior to that, and then the the second incident. All right, so we're on the uh, the corner of the street watching, and I'm holding security for my team, and I see these police vehicles that are being destroyed and the first thing i thought when i saw them was hey you know there's probably uh ar-15 patrol rifles in there which there should you know there honestly should be the police do need them they have more than enough cause to have them so i i told myself i need to keep an eye on this situation because this could turn bad very fast so it it did you know gun comes out of the uh front windshield or front windshield front uh passenger side and i yelled gun put my team immediately in a safe position and told them not to move um that that guy fired several rounds into the those vehicles and then went into a doorway and took cover. At that time, I was when he was uh, firing, I was already moving on him with my uh, drawing my weapon and coming up at him. But you had and a handgun. All, all you had was a handgun. And in the first incident that most people haven't seen, the person, the rider who took the weapon, was actually firing rounds off from that rifle from that carbine. Correct. Yep. Absolutely. And what, who, were they, who were they firing at? Was, was anybody uh, hurt? No, the second that rifle came out, someone was yelling, clear the block, and everyone kind of saw that this guy had a rifle, and he fired into the vehicle. But he fired in the vehicle. Everyone had split and went different ways down the street, so there's no one there. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Hugh Hewitt Show. 
Do you believe that the Democrats are invested in economic despair? Because it seems to me they are ignoring every positive sign and emphasizing every negative one. You, all they care about is elections. All they care about is power. They don't care about they don't care about solving problems. Look, look at the look at Tim Scott's law enforcement bill. I mean, they didn't want to even have a conversation about it because, oh, gosh, we, we might pass a bill and then, then the Republicans might get some credit for it. Donald Trump might actually sign something. That wouldn't be good for the Democrats, for Joe Biden. All this is all this is, is they're all talking, no action. They're not out there to help people. They're not out there to help people get a job. They might be out there to help people become dependent, which doesn't help you long term, uh, but not help you get a job. Uh, now, Senator Scott, recent polls show the president down between seven and ten points in Florida. Now, I don't believe those polls. I believe he will win Florida handily. But you know Florida having won three statewide races there in the last nine years. What do you think the president's reelection chances are in Florida? Oh, he's going to win. First off, you go back to look at the polls of my races. I never, none of the polls ever said I was going to win. All the polls were generally out four to seven points. Uh, this is a 50-50 state, but here's why Donald Trump is going to win. He's, you know, does he care about law enforcement? Yes. Do the Democrats? No, they don't care about law enforcement. Does he care about the economy? Yes. Do the Democrats? No. What have they done? They believe in socialism. And think about it. There's some issues down here that are going to help Trump. Cuba. Venezuela. You know, look at well, look at what Joe Biden, he was part of appeasing the Castro regime and he met and meeting with people like Maduro. So keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Folks, I'm talking to my friend Larry Elder, who uh, has produced a glorious film, which uh, I adjure you, A-D-J-U-R-E, I adjure you to see. <laughs> it's called Uncle Tom, UncleTom.com. As a black man in America, uh, thinking, you know, along conservative lines, uh, clearly you suffered a different kind of persecution. I, I must say again, I never thought of myself as a victim. And that's even a victim of, of the kind of name calling that I get from black people. My mother always told me that no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. And I've always felt that whenever I said something, I always had it, had it well thought out. It was always common sense though. I always try to back it up with sources. And when you react with a vicious name, that means you're just out of ammo. And I feel bad for you because we're not having the debate. The problems in the black community have very little to do with, with white racism. I've always said, Eric, if you invented a vaccine to eliminate white racism, it's all, it's, now it's all gone. Are the major problems in the black community still present? Do we still have 70% of black kids raised without fathers? Yes. Do we still have 25% of young black boys having criminal records living in the inner city that's either uh, having been arrested in jail on parole or on probation? Uh, do we still have, a in many of our urban high schools, a 50% urban dropout rate, and many of the kids, when they do graduate, can't read, write, and computer grade level. I mean, we're talking about Baltimore, 13 high schools where 0% of kids, 0%, Eric, can do math at grade level. When I raise these issues and you scream at me and call me an Uncle Tom, you're not having a debate. GE triple eight nine seven one seven two four three Larry Elder Relief Factor.com studio. Eleven shot in under twelve hours in New York City. A violent attempted rapist in the Bronx is arrested. What did the chief uh, commissioner say? Ninety six percent of all the homicides in New York. The victims are black and brown. Ninety six percent. What's the white population in New York? 40, 50%? Headline, Fox News, Chicago drive-by shooting kills 20-month-old child. When is this going to stop? Said the Chicago Police Chief of Operations, Fred Waller. Quote, it seems like just yesterday, it was actually last Saturday, 
I was in front of you all talking about a three-year-old that was killed in the Austin community. And now here in Inglewood, a 20-month-old was just killed. This is happening far too often, he said. Too many times children are killed by senseless violence. And not only just children, but grown-ups also. When is this going to stop? When are we going to say enough is enough? End of quote. When are you going to look at policies that have created conditions so that kids are raised lacking the kind of normal values that society needs to inculcate into people so that we can behave civilly? Unless you're prepared to say that black people are just genetically inclined to commit crime, you better better have a reason for this. And it's not the guns. As our former, former prosecutor from Philadelphia told us. And it's not the rap music. Most of this rap music is bought by white kids in the suburbs. They're not engaging in drive-bys. And you see, the left doesn't want to talk about it because the left created this. What's the left supposed to say? Oh, my goodness, there's too many kids being raised without fathers. Well, the answer then becomes, why is that? The question then becomes, why is that? And the answer is, bad policies you guys keep pursuing. Making it easier and easier and easier not to work. Easier and easier not to work and have a kid. And don't take me. You heard me in that Prager University video about Fathers Matter. LA Times asked poor people and non-poor people, do people on welfare have additional children to get additional money? The non-poor people said, oh no, they, they, they don't do that. 64% of the poor people said, yeah. And in 1986, I believe it was, the LA Times asked poor people whether welfare was a stepping stone to get you on your feet towards self-sufficiency or do you think it's a crutch? More at 41% thought it was a crutch that thought it was a stepping stone for independence at 31%. Is this thing on? And the same question was asked a few years ago. And the number and the percentage of of poor poor people who thought that welfare was a crutch, a trap, was equal to the percentage that thought welfare was a temporary stepping stone to get you on your feet. So even among poor people, at best, they were divided as to whether it was good or bad. A Black Black Lives Matter activist threatened to shut down a Target store if they call the police. You called the police and we're shutting this place down. On black people! 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 people. people. Living around this neighborhood! Money over people. So until so until you stop calling the police, you stop calling the police. We continue to shut your business down. We continue to shut your business down. <sighs> Unless you stop calling the police, we will shut your business down. And the guy holding the bullhorn didn't appear to be black. I don't know what you know. You never know. I mean, think about that. You have a store and the activists come into your store and threaten to shut it down if you call the police? Black people. On 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 black people. Living around this neighborhood. Living around this neighborhood. Living around in this neighborhood. Living around in this neighborhood. Because you prioritize money over people. Because you prioritize money over people. So until you stop calling the police. You stop calling the police. We continue to shut your business down. We continue to shut your business down. Red State wrote about this. Quote, a Black Lives Matter mob descended on a Washington, D.C. Target store on Saturday, threatening to shut down the store's business if it doesn't stop calling the police on black people. The protest leader, as you heard, 
Janet, quote, all black people living in this neighborhood, living around this neighborhood because you prioritize money over people. So until you stop calling the police, we will continue to shut your business down. Close quote. Until you stop calling the police. I got this letter the other day. I want to read it to you. Larry. I observed last week at a West L.A. Ralph's Market. A very clumsy shoplifting by an adult male. I informed the manager of what I saw, and we both watched this man walk out of the market in front of us. The manager said she is forbidden by her employer under penalty of losing her job to approach or interfere. I contacted Kroger Company, who owns Ralph's, and I got the same statement of policy. That person says this occurs all day long every day, but all their stores are covered by insurance for this kind of loss. I asked what they suggested I tell my grandkids, had they been with me, whether shoplifting is right or wrong. The corporate executive told me that is my business, not theirs. I contacted Vanguard, the biggest shareholder of the Kroger stock in one of their mutual funds. I was told that my story would be passed on, but they have yet to follow up by contacting me. I have heard that the police will not arrest anyone for shoplifting if the value is under $900. I'm not sure if this is accurate, but if it is, who spends more than $900 in one purchase in a grocery store, or in any average shop for that matter? And why would anyone who's so inclined pay for any purchase under $900? I guess it would only come down to a matter of morals. I've heard that people enter stores with calculator, so they add up the property to make sure it comes under 900 because under 900 It's just a misdemeanor. And would you think that crime has gone up? So we're releasing people early because of prison overcrowding. Releasing people early because of coronavirus. Not prosecuting people who steal less than $900. And you're surprised crime has gone up. Even Leo Terrell is starting to come around. This is why Black Lives Matter is basically, in my opinion, the Al Sharpton of the 21st century. They're, they're profiteers. They are profiting on trying to give a narrative, a false narrative, that is white racist cops uh, that's destroying the black community. You point out Chicago. No black lives presence walking through the neighborhood protesting to stop black on black crime. Al Sharpton goes to the George Floyd funeral, use a, use a funeral to launch a campaign speech attacking Donald Trump. I don't see Al Sharpton in Chicago, that three-year-old kid who was killed. You know why? Because it's not profitable. What happened to Leo Terrell? It took me 20, 20 years, but I finally deprogrammed him. I'm Larry Elder. Trending now on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Do you believe that the Democrats are invested in economic despair? Because it seems to me they are ignoring every positive sign and emphasizing every negative one. You, all they care about is elections. All they care about is power. They don't care about they don't care about solving problems. Look, look at the look at Tim Scott's law enforcement bill. I mean, they didn't want to even have a conversation about it. Because, oh, gosh, we, we might pass a bill and then, then the Republicans might get some credit for it. Donald Trump might actually sign something. That wouldn't be good for the Democrats, for Joe Biden. All this is, all this is, is they're all talking, no action. They're not out there to help people. They're not out there to help people get a job. They might be out there to help people become dependent, which doesn't help you long term, uh, but not help you get a job. 
Uh, uh, now, Senator Scott, recent polls show the president down between seven and ten points in Florida. Now, I don't believe those polls. I believe he will win Florida handily. But you know Florida having won three statewide races there in the last nine years. What do you think the president's reelection chances are in Florida? Oh, he's going to win. First off, you go back to look at the polls of my races. I never, none of the polls ever said I was going to win. All the polls were generally out four to seven points. Uh, this is a 50-50 state, but here's why Donald Trump is going to win. He's, you know, does he care about law enforcement? Yes. Do the Democrats? No, they don't care about law enforcement. Does he care about the economy? Yes. The De- Democrats? No. What have they done? They believe in socialism. And think about it. There's some issues down here that are going to help Trump. Cuba. Venezuela. You know, look at well, look at what Joe Biden. He was part of appeasing the Castro regime, and he met and meeting with people like Maduro. So, keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Folks, I'm talking to my friend Larry Elder, who. Uh, has produced a glorious film, which uh, I adjure you, A-D-J-U-R-E. I adjure you to see. (laughs) It's called Uncle Tom, Tom uncletom.com. As a black man in America, uh, thinking, you know, along conservative lines, uh, clearly you suffered a different kind of persecution. I, I must say again, I never thought of myself as a victim, and that's even a victim of of the kind of name calling that I get from black people. My mother always told me that no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. And I've always felt that whenever I said something, I always had it, had it well thought out. It was always common sense ago. I always try to back it up with sources. And when you react with a vicious name, that means you're just out of ammo. And I feel bad for you because we're not having the debate. The problems in the black community have very little to do with, with white racism. I've always said, Eric, if you invented a vaccine to eliminate white racism, it's all, it's now it's all gone. Are the major problems in the black community still present? Do we still have 70% of black kids raised without fathers? Yes. Do we still have 25% of young black boys having criminal records living in the inner city that's either uh, having been arrested in jail on parole or on probation? Uh, do we still have, a, in many of our urban high schools, a 50% urban dropout rate? And many of the kids, when they do graduate, can't read, write, and compute at grade level? I mean, we're talking about Baltimore, 13 high schools where 0% of kids, 0%, Eric, can do math at grade level. When I raise these issues and you scream at me and call me an Uncle Tom, you're not having a debate that might very well improve the educational prospect of your own child. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. in a bad cops, but the 98%, they're great. And when you talk about Chicago, you talk about Atlanta, you talk about Washington, D.C. and L.A., this big lie, Mark, of systemic discrimination. How can you have systemic discrimination in Chicago when the leadership is minority? I know what systemic discrimination is. It does not exist. But yet, this is the narrative that the Black Lives leadership portrays the democratic leadership systemic discrimination it doesn't exist they don't know what they're talking about this is not 1960 we don't have bull connor and the german shepherds this is 2020 i uh, african american on your show it's not like it was 50 years ago but black lives in- matter and the democratic leadership wants you to think it's 1960 well i'm sick of that narrative 888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243, Larry Elder, ReliefFactor.com studio. I'm, I'm stunned. Pleasantly surprised. I'll take it. Now, this is a guy who 
routinely talked about how racist America is and how racist the police department is. And, and now he's realizing. Uh, maybe, just maybe, uh, they're not as bad as I thought they were. Meanwhile, in New York, there's a piece by a very, very good writer named Michael Goodwin. He writes for the New York Post. Headline, Bill de Blasio's performance grows worse by the day, making New York City unlivable. He said, leadership is nowhere to be found. Without it, the city is fast becoming unlivable. The slow exodus of recent years has quickened in recent months with native long timers and recent arrivals clogging the exits. They're going to the suburbs, to Florida, anywhere but here. Always before, the departed were replaced by new seekers. It is impossible to believe that swap will continue. The problems are many, but the linchpin is Mayor Bill de Blasio, writes Goodwin, whose performance grows worse by the day. There is nothing endearing about his act, only a long list of examples of how little he cares and how little he does. New York has had its share of corrupt and incompetent mayors, but never has it had one who is both of those and also a lazy bum. With restaurants wanting to know the rules for reopening, de Blasio diddled until the last minute. Their survival was at stake, but he couldn't be bothered. What's the plan for schools in the fall? Good question, but don't ask the mayor. He hasn't gotten around to that yet. Besides, the issue only involves a million students, their families, teachers, coaches, principals, and administrators. They must wait for their chief political popinjay to bestir himself. Crime is soaring. Murder is up 25%, and de Blasio responds by vowing to cut the police budget. The aim is not to do more with less, it's to get the cops to do less. And this is a death wish. For weeks, illegal fireworks have exploded throughout the night, and a three-year-old Bronx boy is among the injured innocents. Thousands of complaints pour in, to which the mayor shrugs, and says cops and firefighters have many other things to do. Police are quitting in droves, and nobody should blame them. Would you risk your life to enforce the law under this mayor? Friday produced a perfect contrast between what New York needs and what Bill de Blasio does. The Post reported that a homeless man who called himself Jesus turned the dry fountain at Washington Square Park into his crash pad, complete with six chairs, a box of clothes, and a beach umbrella. He has been there a week, and the city, having failed to coax him out, refuses to force him out. Instead, the mayor went to Brooklyn for a photo op as he grabbed a brush to help paint Black Lives Matter on the street. Goodwin later on writes that the mayor has 18 more months in office before he's term limited. But the list of wannabes is disheartening. Their common criticism of de Blasio is he's not progressive enough. Quote, and they promise to do twice as many dumb things, especially when it comes to raising taxes and handcuffing cops, end of quote. He ends the article with this. De Blasio no longer defends the NYPD and one by one, the anti-crime programs that made New York miraculously safe are being thrown in the trash. Speaking of Chicago, Chicago man fatally shoots two teens after they ask him how tall he is. I am not Making this up. Investigators say Leroy Battle, 19 years old, shot the teens in the alley last Saturday. There was an interaction between the murderer, suspected murderer, 
and the two teens. You know why? Battle is six foot three. And at a convenience store, these two teens ask him how tall he was when they were buying candy. Deputy Chief of Detectives said, quote, the victims commented because Battle is quite tall and they ask him how tall he was and, you know, that they hope to be that tall someday. So Battle follows him out, fires nine shots. At the three teens, there were three of them, shot two of them, and killed them. One 17 years old was shot in the back, the chest, and left hand, taken to a hospital where he died. Another 16 years old, shot in the back and left leg, taken to the hospital where he died. Third teen not struck. The boys had asked their mothers if they could go down the block to buy some candy. And two of them never returned. He, he was asked how tall he is. Did he misunderstand the question? Do you think that they were being insulting? He follows him out and shoots him in the back and kills him? And we're talking about removing Confederate monuments. Really? New York is about 42.7% white. By the way, Congressman Al Green is from Texas. I think I said New York last week. We strive to be 100% accurate in the Larry Elder Show. 888-971-SAGE. What did Robert E. Lee say about Confederate monuments? All of that and more. I am Larry Elder. If you could do one thing that changed you forever, would you? How about something extraordinary? A bucket list item packing years of memories into 10 exciting days. Chart a new path by joining Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Set a clear new vision for yourself this year and join me on the Stand with Israel tour this December 2nd to 11th. Along with special guest Mike Lindell. God freed me from these and other addictions and started me on a path to a restored heart. Praise Jesus. Discover over 40 iconic sites as you encounter the life-changing impact of a journey to the Holy Land. Surrounded by like-minded travelers, picture yourself stepping foot in key locations right out of history. Much more than a vacation, this journey guides you through one of the most politically and spiritually significant places in the world. Explore Jerusalem, Galilee, the Dead Sea region, and so much more. Along the way, Dr. Sebastian Gorka will broadcast live and on-site as you watch and participate. Reserve your spot today for this incredible journey. Call today to join Dr. Sebastian Gorka on this life-enriching Israel tour, December 2nd to 11th, 2020. Call 855-565-5519 or book online at standwithisraeltour.com. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. Bubba gets um, Don Lemon and defends himself. He doesn't say, isn't this wonderful? See, if a, a decent man, and I don't know him from Adam, but I can only say a decent man would have said, I am so relieved. If I found uh, something anti-Semitic in my workplace, do you know how relieved I would be to, to learn it was not, in fact, anti-Semitic at all? That I had misapprehended what it was? Why isn't he relieved for himself, for NASCAR, and for the country? Tell me why. Why does this not indict his character? I, I, I would almost pay for somebody who wants to defend his decency to call in now. 1-8-Prager-776. 877-243-7776. Leftism 
makes you a worse human being. Black, white, biracial, L, G, B, T, Q, cisgender, non-gender, transgender, Jew, Christian, atheist, secularist, Mormon, Buddhist, get it? Whatever you are, leftism makes you worse. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Burke. What is your response to the uh, the so-called national anthem issue, Trish? You know what? It's it's so wrong. It's misplaced, um, and it's very hypocritical. That's what I would say, Seb. Look, it's not an easy song to sing. Trust me. I mean, the the range is all over the place. And, you know, this has been debated, actually, in in music circles for years. I mean, I heard decades ago about... All across America, The Larry Elder Show. Hey, Larry. Ransford in L.A. When did it make you every ist and schist in the book to say the statement, all lives matter, and if you don't resist arrest, 99.99999% of the time you won't be hurt. This is what is probably lacking in every police reform bill that comes out. The, the, the suspects need to be retrained. This is how you act when a police officer conf- uh, approaches you. That with, with, if that doesn't change, practically nothing else will. Triple eight nine seven one S A G E triple eight nine seven one seven two four three. Larry Elder, ReliefFactor dot com studio. Mike Lindell, he's giving back. He's making face masks and he's giving them free to hospitals all around the country. He's also offering great discounts on all of his products. Just go to mypillow dot com right now. Click on the radio listener special. Check out the buy one get one freeze on Supima my pillows, Giza dream sheets, my pillow towels, roll and go anywhere pillows, duvet covers, Giza pillowcases, bolster pillows, neck pillows. Plus, if you buy Mike Lindell's book, What Are the Odds? From Crack Addict to CEO, you're going to get free shipping and a twenty five dollar gift card. So just go to mypillow dot com, enter promo code Larry, or call eight hundred eight nine zero eighteen forty three. Be sure and use promo code Larry. This. Uh, Cancel culture. I don't call it cancel culture. I call it revenge culture. Mount Rushmore. George Washington's up there. Thomas Jefferson's up there. They both own slaves. Washington Monument. Got to go. John Wayne Airport gave an interview in 1971 and said some intemperate things. So therefore, he's a racist. Got to go. What about the Democratic Party? The modern Democratic Party started in roughly 19, 1828, and one of their founding principles was the preservation of slavery. Republican Party, founding principle to stop the spread of it. Hello? Shouldn't we be defunding anything having to do with Democrats, including the DNC? This is from 1924 Democratic National Convention. Listen to this. At the National Democratic Convention in New York in 1924, it is estimated that at least 350 delegates were Klansmen. Uh, did you get that? Or was that too fast? At the National Democratic Convention in New York in 1924, it is estimated that at least 350 delegates were Klansmen. 350 delegates, Klansmen, 1924. Democrat, Klansmen. Democrats founded the KKK. But uh, what's it? Uh, 61% of Democrats believe Republicans are racist, slash bigoted, slash sexist. Over 80% believe Donald, Donald Trump's racist. Never mind what Chris Matthews inadvertently revealed. Mainly it's for white people, because white people won't vote for a guy, most of them, if they think they're racist. Now, 
in New York, Bill de Blasio shut down an anti-crime unit that many people credit with eliminating a lot of the gun violence. Also, he's eliminated the, the plain clothesmen that used to work in neighborhoods and problem areas. They're gone. So he's removed the plain clothes people. He shut down the anti-crime unit. And shockingly, crime has gone up in New York. Breitbart is reporting that June 23, from June 23 the year before, Shootings up 358% year to year. There were 55 shootings in New York, June 14 to June 20, compared to 12 for the same week in 2019. Chicago. Over a 24-hour period that began 4 p.m. on Friday, 20 people were shot, 7 killed, including that 20-month-old boy I told you about, shot dead while riding with his mom. Yeah, they were just in the car. Car was riddled with something like seven bullets. Three-year-old boy named Melky James sitting in his car. His father was driving when he was struck. This is last Saturday. Police said the toddler was shot in the chest. A bullet grazed his 22-year-old mother in the head. They were driving home from a laundromat. Seven shots fired at the car, according to the police. Detectives believe the boy's mother may have been targeted, but they don't know. So far, unsolved, as are 75% of homicides in Chicago. Now, here's what Kent in Arkansas said about Relief Factor. I have been taking Relief Factor for about three months, and I am amazed at how much my pain has decreased. In rainy weather, I would be in ludicrous pain and just wanting to crawl in bed and cry. As of this writing, it's been raining all day, and I feel just fine. Before Relief Factor, I never had a day when something didn't hurt. Now, most days I have great quality of life. I consistently take three packets a day, and I do not mind the extra expense. It is better than the pain. Thank you, Relief Factor. What about you? ReliefFactor.com, ReliefFactor.com, 800-583-84, 800-583-84. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Folks, I'm talking to my friend Larry Elder, who uh, has produced a glorious film called Uncle Tom, UncleTom.com. Larry Elder, who are some of the figures that appear in this film? I mentioned a couple of them a moment ago. You mentioned Carol Swain. She was a law professor at Vanderbilt uh, in Tennessee cut all sorts of grief because she, among other things, opposed race-based preferences, argued that they actually hurt black people uh, because you're putting them on a track much faster than they could handle. They would have been perfectly uh, fine at a lesser competitive school, but because we decided that there ought to be some sort of racial mixture at at a given school, whether the kid can do the work or not. We've also got Herman Cain in there. Uh, Herman Cain uh, was, of course, maligned as an Uncle Tom and a sellout when he ran, because by definition, any black person who's a Republican is an Uncle Tom and a sellout. Never mind the skanky history of the Democratic Party, which, by the way, we go over in the film, uh, I think, pretty thoroughly. The Democratic Party, of course, is a party of slavery. Uh, Democrats unanimously oppose the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment. Larry, Democrats- I just want to interrupt. When, when people say stuff like what you're saying right now, I always have to hit pause and say, Nobody knows this. It can't be right that the Democrats are the party of slavery and the KKK. And in your film, you cover a lot of this. Another reason people need to go see Uncle Tom, the film. This movie was about one of my liberal friends saw it and said, I'm surprised. I thought Uncle Tom was going to be a kind of an autobiography about you. I said, that would have been boring. I'm barely in the movie, as you know. Uh, And he said, you're not telling people what to think. You're saying in America, you are free to think for yourself without being maligned as somebody who's a self-loather. That's all the movie asks. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending. 
trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. Are we witnessing simply 1968 redux? Or is this a far more cynical um, shell game whereby the left, the institutional left, says we have no way to win the election on policy platforms, so we're going to use uh, violence on the streets, and that's going to be a feint or a dodge. I- is, are these people sincere, Professor, or is this a political play? Well, it's being aided and abetted by the DNC, and they see it as useful as a lot of uh, would-be architects of revolution do. They think it's useful to cause chaos or to pressure the blue states not to participate in the recovery or whatever their agenda for the November uh, election. And in that sense, uh, it's a little different. What I see is different from 68 is we didn't have mayors and governors actively resisting help from the federal government and either sympathizing with or appeasing or contextualizing the violence as we do in Seattle and Minneapolis. Oh, Philadelphia, here's Detroit. Larry the Elder. Thing is Larry, there was you're amazing. Your show is amazing. I don't even care if this gets on the air. In fact, it, it really, yeah, it doesn't even matter. If you have the president's ear at all, he seriously needs to focus on the fatality rate of COVID, which is really, really good. Not not the cases, which the mainstream media wants to focus on. They want to focus on cases, which are going to go up when you test more people. We need to focus on the actual fatality rate. We've done a really good job with therapeutics and treating people and blood thinners and you name it, ventilators. It, it has to be about the fatality rate, which is zero, zero, zero point whatever. Trump needs to seriously make that a message. Triple eight nine seven one S A G E triple eight nine seven one seven two four three. Larry Elder, Elefactor dot com studio. I agree with you. What's relevant uh, is the fact that the deaths are declining, but they're going to spike up because the cases are a lagging indicator. So they're going to go up to some degree. I don't know how much. Let me let me just suggest this to you. Let's suppose this happened under President Obama. And Obama said to the American people, essentially Trump's position, which is, we're going to have to coexist. Can't shut down the government over something like this. You just can't. There are going to be suicides. There's going to be alcoholism. There's going to be drug abuse. There's going to be spousal abuse, bankruptcies, and all the health-related consequences attendant to filing bankruptcy. We know there are high-risk people. We know that people with so-called comorbidities, people who are obese, have high blood pressure, are especially at risk. We know that social distancing helps. We know that masks help. But beyond that, until and unless we get a vaccine or a really effective treatment, we're going to have to coexist. Suppose Obama said that. Would people say, he doesn't care about the American people. He's trading profits for lives. Would they say that? Or would they say, well, that's perfectly reasonable. That's how he is. He's very thoughtful. He's very, uh, he's very insightful. He weighs all the equities and he's come up with the idea that there's not a whole lot we can do. Except take normal precautions. And recognize that there are going to be costs and benefits. And recognize that we need to protect the most vulnerable, the elderly. Suppose Obama said that. Which is essentially what Trump has been saying. What do you think the reaction would be? They'd be talking about how in 1968, there was a Hong Kong flu. And if you adjust the number of Americans who died for the population of today... That's about 150,000, which is still lower than what we have right now. That's, that's what they would say if it were Obama. Well, some people are t- focusing on cases, but they ought to focus on in deaths. And we're down almost 70% in the rate of, of, uh, of increase of deaths. That's what they would be saying if their guy was in there. The same way they kept coming up with rationalization after rationalization regarding this awful recovery we had. Well... 
It's a financial recession, and those are very different than normal recessions. I thought all recessions were financial. Silly me. Well, this is a new normal. Well, we're doing better than other countries. That's the kind of stuff they trotted out month after month after month, year after year to defend against this tepid recovery, the worst recovery since 1949, the first president ever to preside over a recovery where there wasn't at least one year of 3% growth. Why? He taxed, he spent, he saddled the economy with additional regulations. What did Trump do? He cut the corporate tax, he rolled back the regulations, and voila, the economy took off. Surprise, surprise. So, under a President Obama, if he had said about this pandemic, I'm not going to wear a mask. I, you know, it's up, up to you, your choice. But by wearing a mask, it suggests that we need to somehow change our lives dramatically. And I, President Obama, I don't want to do that. Not saying masks are bad. I'm just saying I personally don't. Well, you know, he, he's got a point. He's got a point. He's, you know, he's, he, what he's saying is we, ought, we shouldn't be hysteric. They would be rationalizing everything. Same as they're going to defend and protect Joe Biden until the election. He could reek of formaldehyde and they'll still say he was sharp. It won't matter. No matter how many mistakes he makes, <laughs> it's old Joe. Hey, uh, come on, you can't pick on him because he's old. He, he can't say anything about his, de- but you can't accuse him of having dementia. It's okay for us to say that President Trump needs to put his doctor on television so we can prove that he's not mentally or physically unfit to hold the office. We can do that. But regarding Joe Biden and, and possible dementia, you can't say that. That's cruel. Now, regarding my movie, I'm getting so many tremendous letters. I just finished Uncle Tom, says Aaron from San Jose. And I want to thank you for your wonderful film. You are a huge part of my transition from default Democrat to proud conservative patriot over the past three years. Uncle Tom is a brilliant movie because it brims with optimism and hope for all Americans. Particularly poignant was the clap of Candace Owens addressing an audience at the White House saying, this is so beautiful, look at all of us, we made it all the way to the White House. This is Barbara from Kentucky. I just watched Uncle Tom. It was amazing. I want the entire country to see it. That would require a really big theater, wouldn't it? I mean, massive. This one is from Oscar from Maryland. Larry, I was suspended from Twitter for accurately pointing out that Uncle Tom was the hero of the book in a thread started by you and where a respondent asked why you were being inflammatory. My appeal contained a link to the Wikipedia entry for the book where Uncle Tom is described as a noble hero and a plea to Google Josiah Henson, Uncle Tom's real-life inspiration. While my account remains active, I cannot access unless I delete that tweet. I won't delete it. Uncle Tom martyred himself to help two slaves escape, and I won't be complicit in rewriting history, nor will I willingly accept an unchallenged strike on my Twitter account. It's going on three days, and Twitter hasn't... Reviewed my appeal. Can you help? I, I can send screenshots if given an email address. Going on three days. I'll see what I can do. Now, Brian from Alabama said this about Relief Factor. After taking Relief Factor for three weeks, at least 90% of my pain is gone. My pain had begun to limit my mobility and my ability to get things done at work and home. I'm amazed at the relief I have gotten. I should have taken, I should have started taking Relief Factor a year ago when I first heard about it. Reggie, Florida. I have a lot of pain from aging, and after only four days of using Relief Factor, I am already experiencing less pain and less stiffness. Can't wait to see how I feel in a couple more weeks. Relief Factor is a blessing sent by God. What about you? The three-way quick start could be at your day and be at your door in a couple of days. Relieffactor.com, relieffactor.com. 800 583 
Trending now on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Now, there is a story this morning that one of the best guys in the Senate on the other side, Chris Coons, is talking about doing away with the legislative filibuster. I personally do not believe that they will they will hesitate for a minute if they win the Senate, which is why we've got to reelect Cory Gardner and Tom Tillis and Martha McSally and David Perdue and Joni Ernst. And there are a couple others who they're targeting. But do you think they will do away with the legislative filibuster, Senator well, Scott? And what do you, you think will be the consequences of that? Chris, Chris Coons led the effort to keep it when Trump got elected. Right. And now he's leading the effort to get rid of it. If Biden gets elected, I mean, how disingenuous that somebody would do that. Take this position if this person's the president, this position, this person president. However, I've been there 18 months. It's really consistent. The Democrats do it every day. So, yeah, do I believe they'll get rid of it? Yeah, they'll, they'll do that. They'll try to stack the Supreme Court. You know, they'll, they'll do everything they can to make sure they have power forever. That's all they care. They don't care about you. They don't care about making your life better. They, they care about their power. That's what they care about every day. The Democrats, all they care about is power. Senator, you just said they'll stack the Supreme Court. You don't really believe, do you, that they will move to expand the number of seats on the Supreme Court? You, they will do everything that they think they can get away with. If you think about this, think about what you just said about Chris Kuhn, a guy that led the effort to make sure we didn't get rid of the filibuster when Trump got elected but is now going to lead the effort to get rid of the filibuster if Biden gets elected. So what else will they do? Senator Rick Scott, uh, that'll make some news, and I appreciate it always when you make news on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Thank you. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Lon Hee Chen of the Hoover Institution for townhall.com. Public health officials across America have spent the last several months warning about the dangers of the coronavirus and the need for us to stay at home, halt economic activity, and avoid social interactions with our friends and neighbors. We are now reopening our economy in many parts of the country, but these same public health officials have compromised their own credibility as we do so. On the one hand, they've urged caution and a slow return to work, school, and faith gatherings. They've criticized those who oppose the stay-at-home orders. But at the same time, these officials have been broadly supportive of the large protests on America's streets in the last few weeks. Public health officials should be helping us understand the comparative risks of activities, not endorsing the causes they like while prohibiting the ones they don't. Their hypocrisy is costly indeed. They have impacted our ability to address future health crises. I'm Lon He Chen. ADF, fighting for those whose liberties are being violated. America, we have a country to save. And now, here's Larry Elder. Larry, what's up? Chris here in North Carolina. Just wanted to say that um, Nancy Pelosi's face is showing so much wear and tear because she's tried to keep a straight face for so long while BSing the whole country for 40 years. Thank you. Have a good time. Love you, man. Love you, too. 888-971-SAGE. 888 Seven two four three Larry Elder ReliefFactor dot com studio. We've got a country to save. The zip poll question I left you with on Friday: Assuming you were working before the coronavirus stay at home order went into effect, are you now back to work? What percentage of people, Mister McConnell, said that they are not back to work yet? Mister McConnell said forty three percent. Actually, twenty five percent. Seventy five percent said they're back. Here's the one for. Tonight, and I'll give you the results tomorrow. Do you think President Trump should wear a mask in public? Either yes or no. In order to participate, you must be a member of the Zip community. Go to your app store, download the Zip app by searching under Zip Poll USA, and be sure and use my code SAGE, S A G. Can we revisit Joe's call? Joe is in Philadelphia. He is a former prosecutor. Joe, thank you so much for calling. I appreciate it. Got it, Larry. Uh, Yo from Philadelphia. Wanted to comment on your guns comment. Prosecuted uh, homicide, ag assault, rape, robbery, etc. And guns were not the issue. The no education, no values, and uh, it, it just recycled itself. Mm-hmm. So the guns are not the issue. If they had staff, sergeant, elder, 
as their father. They'd be running the country. So that's the comment, Larry. Well, Joe, thank you so much for for calling. Thank you for your service to your country as a prosecutor. That's enough. Put down the mic. I want to thank Larry for the job he's done. All across America, the mic has been dropped. The Larry Elder Show.